Uh, so I'm just going to hammer home those key takeaways again. Thank you, Meredith and Tom. So economic conditions and net interest margins were ranked by community bankers as the top external risks. Inflation was described as persistent but manageable. Cybersecurity ranked first in importance among internal risks, as well as in current and future technological challenges. Related to cybersecurity issues, implementing and maintaining new technologies is difficult uh, and affecting how great of a priority it is. And retention of staff continues to be a pressing issue for community bankers. And so now I think we get to get into the fun part, uh, which is Q&A. Went a little too far. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and now I think if there's one lesson that we've probably taken away from this pandemic, it's turning the mic on and off and keeping track of that. Now today, you need to pay special attention to it because the remote viewers won't be able to hear you if you're asking a question, your mic in front of you is not on. So with that, um, Alan, I see your hand up, go ahead. Thanks very much. I hear the mic is on, it's very good. And thanks very much. And it's really great to be back here in person. I'm, I'm really enjoying it already. It's, a, it's fantastic. Looking forward to Mickey's comments in a moment. Uh, I do, and I, I, like the, I like what you did with the, with the survey. This is really good. You're always improving it every year, but I do have to make a point about your comment at the very beginning, Joey, because you know, it is, you're, you're absolutely correct. We are beyond the health concerns of the, of the uh, crisis, at least here in the US, and we're in the aftermath. But let's just make sure we keep an eye on the big picture. We are, we are not free of COVID-19 at all. Uh, the aftermath, the, the reasons we have inflation, the reasons we have supply chain uh, breakdowns, the reason we have a lot of things going on are related, are related to COVID-19. And you know, it, there's nothing wrong with what you're saying, but I'm saying, you know, when we want to think about things for the future, we want to make sure that we understand there are always these interconnections that we can't forget about because if they're going to, they're going to be future crises, believe me, I don't know what, I don't know what kind they'll be or something, they're, they're probably all kinds, but let's always be sure we're thinking, we're thinking broadly that these things are interconnected and let's, let's not forget that. Thank you. Excellent comment. Thanks, Alan. Christine. There's, there's a wide variety of data here. And like Ella noted, it gets improved upon every year, which is fantastic. I'm curious about your views about what you think or hope maybe community groups or bankers will do with this data beyond this presentation today. Yeah, you want to take that, Meredith? You want me to? So I'll sure. Start. OK, you, you can start. I can start. So uh, from a, a policy kind of perspective, I, I hope that we can we can learn, um, you know, what the experiences are of community bankers. I think what uh, Governor Bowman had uh, to say a few years ago when we started doing the survey that it's a window into um, a community bankers experience to really understand kind of where they are. And so I think that's important um, from a policy side of view so that we can understand, you know, what what uh, uh, changes might need to be made there, what specifically they're most concerned about, you know, regulatory burden, cost availability of labor, inflation, um, whatever. And, and so that, that's, that's one big takeaway that I hope that we can get out of the survey. Yeah, so I would, I would agree with what Tom said. I think it's always, uh, it's always important, right? I mean, it, we, we, it was always important to have the numbers. So, I mean, kind of seeing, um, these responses in, in aggregate. I mean, that, that's the whole point of doing a survey, right? Or the C, uh, CBSI, the um, sentiment index, is to be able to take this kind of one step above to uh, policymakers that they're able to see how community banking as a field um, is, is really thinking about the direction of uh, where, where this is going. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I believe strongly in the importance of, of outreach and, um, you know, and, 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 and connecting one on one with uh, community bankers, but I think there's something really powerful in having this kind of data collected annually and being able to see it over time um, and, and have that be kind of a, a baseline for where the community banking field um, has has been and, and where where it will go so. Thanks, Christine. Daniel, I saw your hand. Hi. Um, 
I find surprising that 8% of the respondents um, do not take cryptocurrencies uh, as one of the large concerns, uh, given that one third of young Americans aged uh, between 18 and 29 uh, have declared recently uh, trading on crypto and uh, efforts by uh, Biden administration executive orders uh, calling all the agencies to provide a draft or a plan of action in crypto space and also the central bank digital currency being probably developed in the next years. Um, so I would like to know your insight. Sure, that's it. Oh, go ahead, Tom. I, I, I would, I was surprised too, uh, frankly, that, that that number was um, as low as it was. And I, I think it came out, uh, you know, that they were, they're, they're uncertain really about kind of how that's gonna roll out, what the, what the future is um, going to be on that. So uh, it's certainly, an incredibly important area for our financial institutions to be aware of and to um, uh, know how they're going to deal with it. So um, I, I think that'll be one. And Meredith, maybe you can add to this, you know, what we're going to be looking at in the future surveys and, and what we might learn from that. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I think I think it's a I, I want to make sure that the question is understood um, correctly, because I don't think community bankers were saying this is not important, this, that this is not a concern of theirs, they're not monitoring the direction of this. I think that right at where we're capturing responses at this point in time is what are community bankers doing about this? Like what, what are they addressing um, crypto assets uh, purchases? Are they facilitating those within their own institution? So I don't think, you know, I think, well, I should say that I think it, I'm glad that we have started including a question on crypto, um, even though there hasn't been, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the responses are kind of different than what we were, what we were thinking. Uh, but that's not the point, right? What we're thinking. Um, the, the point is, is to be able to start asking these questions and then be able to ask them in consecutive years so we can see what changes, um, you know, I mean, who knows what's going to happen next year or five years from now and the role that community bankers will be will be um, or the role that community bankers will be taking in the in the crypto space. Meredith and Tom, we do have some questions from our virtual audience or some comments. Jeff Plague from Iowa, the Iowa uh, Superintendent of Banking would like to come off mute now. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yep. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, very good. Um, so probably more of a comment than a question, um, and it probably related to, it'll be interesting on the next survey, Tom, what this shows up, but in the last, you know, pre-COVID, the thing I heard most about from bankers' concerns, uh, along with cyber and some other things, but was lack of deposit growth and lack of liquidity. COVID dumped a lot of money into the system, PPP dumped a lot of money in the system, so all of a sudden everybody had excess liquidity. But it's been surprising to me in the last 60 days how fast this is becoming an issue again, partly because that excess liquidity was invested, partly because loan demand is still fairly strong. And so it's um, uh, and deposits now have shrunk. Uh, uh, public federal money has quit flowing in. Uh, and so it will be interesting. Net interest margin was part of your survey, uh, but I think that mainly was reflected more in the competition for loan demand and the competition for loan rates. It'll be interesting now in the next survey um, to see how that surfaces uh, because of cost of funds, because the, the, the public funds market has lit up overnight, essentially, uh, and, and, and there will be other stages of that in deposit growth or deposit funding as well. Uh, and um, uh, unless loan demand slows down, that's I think will be a increasing uh, issues uh, reflected in your survey. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I I, I think you're right on that, and things it, it, it shows too how things can change pretty rapidly uh, from you know swinging from one end of the spectrum to the other. Yeah, and as Federal Home Loan Bank has acknowledged, uh, borrowing is back up. I mean, they're yeah. coming in from that angle, um, but obviously the cost of that borrowing is up dramatically from what it was uh, three months ago as well. So, yep. yeah, and Jeff, Thank I you. would just oh yeah, I would just add. Um, 
that, you know, I think loan demand, I believe, was the third most um, important risk that was identified. So it hasn't, it hadn't gone anywhere. I mean, from, um, from uh, it just, it just fell a little bit below economic conditions this year, but cost of funds and loan demand are always kind of at the top of, um, you know, when it comes to, to risk. So like you, like you said, I imagine that uh, we'll be seeing that uh, show up more so in the survey next year. Yeah, the, the net margin squeeze will come from both ends. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm seeing a lot of hands go up. Dwight, why don't you go ahead? Well, I want to talk a little bit about the second most important or critical issue facing us, and that's personnel. Um, got two questions here. Was there any insight in the survey about the back to office strategies that community bankers are using? Um, we find a lot of um, individuals that we would like to employ want to have that work from home feature. So is, was there any insight as to how that was handled? And second question is uh, talent uh, development. I'm finding it very hard to fill the full spectrum of experience. Right now I'm very heavy on very experienced, but also very expensive. Uh, and I really need to develop younger talent. I don't have the resources to run big training programs like the bigger banks do. What is what are the community bankers doing to, to try to develop that new layer of, of talent? So I'll say, I mean, and I'm obviously not a community banker, I can't, so I can't speak um, yeah, directly to this, but uh, within the survey, um, you know, I mean, the, the, there wasn't, uh, in, in terms of the questions that were asked, that the risk question was really the only place where we had touched on workforce. But I will say, and if you look in the um, in the uh, survey publication um, that's available online, uh, we did um, what, at the, the last question of the of the survey allowed for a qualitative uh, response. Um, and there, uh, plus the interviews that we did interviews with community bankers, um, in those two places were is where we really saw. Um, how how community bakers and how they how they were thinking about workforce issues and expressing some of the same concerns that you did. So, um, I mean, I would I don't know if we can even open it up to to uh, the floor. I mean, if there's other um, community bankers in the room that uh, would be able to to directly answer your question better. But um, in terms of what the the survey offered this year. Um, it was really a place to kind of talk about the future of community banking, and that's where we saw a lot of respondents um, detail their experience on workforce issues, and then also in the interviews that we had with the community bankers. The only thing I'd add is that it, it, those uh, interviews are really worth reading, um, you know, to get uh, a perspective across uh, different institutions and around the country. There's um, good stuff in there. So I think we have time for just one more question. So I'm gonna call on Commissioner Boskin in the back. Thank you, Joey. I'm sorry, I have to lean over a little bit. This question's for Tom. I think I heard you say that labor quality is declining. I'm wondering if you can expound on that a little bit and if you haven't have thought of any solutions or um, ideas for ways community bankers can deal with that problem. Yeah, so I bit like Dwight's question. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I don't think I said labor quality is declining. So uh, the, the number of job openings and, you know, the job opening labor turn, turnover survey shows that there's a lot of, uh, of jobs available that are out there. Um, now, I have heard uh, anecdotally through conversations with a lot of community bankers and a lot of smaller businesses that uh, uh, I, I, one community bank I heard recently said, if they can fog a mirror, I hire them, right? So it's, uh, that, that's a, a little bit of a concern because you're just taking bodies as quickly as you could maybe get them and hoping, um, like was mentioned earlier, that you can develop the talent in some way. And so, uh, you know, I think it's an issue uh, for sure. Um, I don't know that we captured it in, um, we didn't capture that in our survey uh, at all, but uh, 
Um, I'd have to dive a little deeper into you know, the economic data to be able to answer that question about whether that labor quality is declining as well. Uh, we just have a lot of people that have um, really voluntarily taken themselves out of the labor force um, and, and not jump back in. So the labor force participation rate is um, a little lower than I think most people would like it. So we're gonna cut it off right there. We're heading up against our next session, um, but thank you, Tom and Meredith for sharing your insights with us today. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to pass it back over to Jim. And I'll offer my thanks as well uh, to Tom Seams, Meredith Covington, and to, uh, to Joey Samowitz. And would also like to thank all of the bankers across the United States who responded uh, to that survey. It's, uh, it's been nice to watch this um, grow uh, over the years, grow in depth. Uh, Meredith referenced something um, uh, that I think is important to highlight here too, that um, talk about some changes in the survey. So in the past, there would be a number of commissioners would maybe host town hall meetings and gather perspectives, and those would infuse themselves into the narrative. Uh, this year, five bankers, and we call it five questions for five bankers, were very specifically interviewed, and those uh, and their comments are, are by name, they're quoted within the survey publication. And we've got a real nice mix uh, from across the country, so um, I'll just mention the names here, and you can, uh, you can see them in the National Survey publication. Some of their comments are within the narrative, but then the full transcript of our discussions with them uh, can be found in the back of the publication. So Janet Silvera, Community Bank of Santa Maria, it's a bank in California. A Rogers Pope, Texas Bank and Trust Company. Salim Iqbal, Habib American Bank, that's a bank in New York. Joe Conover, Northwest Bank in Iowa. And Kim DeVore, Jonah Bank of Wyoming. So a special thanks to all of uh, those five bankers who participated in our five questions uh, for five bankers series. And I'll just remind everyone, the uh, survey is available online and also out in the lobby uh, on our kiosk. <laughs>